Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sayidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi fi kulli lahdin abada ala ni'amillahi wa afdalihi. Allahumma atina min ladunka rahma wa alimna min ladunka ilma subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma 'allamtana innaka antal alimul hakim bismillahirrahmanirrahim nawaitu ta'allum wa ta'lim wa dhikr wa tadhkir wa nafa' wa lintifa' wa lifada wa listifada wa alhas 'ala at-tamassuk bi kitabillahi wa sunnati rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa du'a ila al-huda wa dalalata 'ala al-khair ibtigha' wajhi Allah wa maradatihi wa qurbihi wa thawabihi subhanahu wa ta'ala ma'a lutfin wa 'afiyatin bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma alhimna ilman nafaqih bihi awamiraka wa nawahiyaka wa rizqna fahman na'arifu bihi kayfa nunajika ya arhamu rahimin Allahumma inna nas'aduka fahman nabiyin wa hifzal mursalin wa ilhamal malaikatil muqarrabin fi afiyati ya arhamu rahimin Allahumma aghina bil alm wa zayyinna bil halm wa akrimna bil taqwa wa jamilna bil afiyah ya arhamu rahimin Amin wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma inna nastawdi'uka ma qara'nahu ma naqra'hu fi hadhal majlis wa ma qablahu ma ba'dahu fahfazhu alayna hatta tarudduhu ilayna waqta ihtiyajina ilayhi ya arhamu rahimin Allahumma akrimna bin nuri al-fahm wa akhrijna min zulumat al-wahm wa aftah lana abwaab rahmatik wa anshur alayna hikmatik ya arhamu rahimin Amin وصلى الله وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اللهم يا مقاليد الامور كلها بيده واليه يرجع الامور كلها يا فتاح يا عالم يا فتاح يا عالم يا فتاح يا عالم افتح علينا فتحا قريبا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري وحل الاقطع الميسان يفقه قولي وسد لساني وهدي قلبي وافعل كذلك باحبابي ابدا وارزقنا كمال المفتوح العارف والفقه في الدين وعلى كمال الاخلاص والسلع واليقين والعافيه والغنى والنصر والحفظ والنفع والانتفاع وخيرات الدارين وعلوم الاولين والاخرين امين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم الفاتحه Point your own intentions, eh? Fatiha. Ay, 
Alhamdulillah 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 we have uh, arrived in the part of our seerah where we are about to enter a different marhala right different marhala meaning a different uh, position right? or different different station or different uh, time right in the seerah right so we have the uh, there's the first part that is before the hijra of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam right which is a very distinct uh, marhala it is a very distinct uh, time right, in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam 13 years in Mecca right whereby it was struggle right it was uh, it was difficulty right uh, it was no popularity right then right and that's why the sunnah of da'wah is it not being popular first right with the people right and then as 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 the truth spreads right more and more people begin to accept it right so that we see that in the first half of uh, the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Of course, we spoke about the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his life before uh, uh, revelation, right? The time before he was forty years old. We spoke about that time also and the, and the events that were around that, right? and that uh, serves for us to deepen our belief, right? That he is indeed a prophet, right? That we see the things that he go through, that he that he went through in life. Right, and we see the miracles around his life, and we see also the the, the difficulty that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has allowed him to go through. Right, so he is. Of course, we know that um, the closer somebody is to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right, the more difficulty Allah tests those whom He loves. Right, so there, there is always you know a test in your life, and sometimes you never notice the test is there. And we, or when we think of test, what we think of tests, we think of you know the calamity, we think of difficulty, we think of loss. Right. But sometimes tests can come in ease and in happiness. And they can also be a test, right? Especially when that test uh, causes you to neglect your prayers or to be uh, frivolous or to be, you know, far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's even a greater test because that kind of test does not drive you down to your knees and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of the night. Right? A different type of test, that, I mean, an easier test is, is a test of loss. And a test of grief, and a test of difficulty, and a test of you know hopelessness. Remember, right? you don't know what else to do, right? Then to wake up in the middle of the night and pray to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and ask of Him. So a bigger test is when everything is going fine, and it's a test. It's a test, right? Everything is going fine. Everything is going well. There's nothing that you really need in life. You're kind of okay, right? Will you still wake up? Will you still call on to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? Will you still? Back Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right, To keep you on the right path right? Because the the, real, the reality of life Is that the calamity is what? Uh, diminishes your iman That is a real calamity right? And blessing is what? Increases your iman So it's, you know, it's, it's a skill It's a skill that we understand right? And of course calamity is when you begin to do more and more this Acts of disobedience and, and, and blessing is when you do more and more Acts of obedience And you, re- and, and you reduce in your acts of disobedience so now we are about to leave right this uh, section of the seerah and we're about to enter a brand new section right whereby the entire um, atmosphere will change and if you look at some of the writings of uh, disbelievers right they would write and it's not true right, but they would write right, in case any of you were to come across these writings because I've I've even had these questions from uh, non uh, from Muslims themselves Right, because they read stuff online, right, and they don't have a teacher, and they don't go for proper classes, right, so they 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 tend to adopt what the non-Muslims say or what you know the enemies of uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They they claim about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they say you know in in comparing in comparing the life in Mecca, life in Medina, right, they say that you know in Mecca, right, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Muhammad was a prophet, and right, he was humble, and he was a a preacher to his people. Right, and then they would they would claim this is not true. They would claim that in 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 Medina, right, when he began to be a ruler, he began to be power hungry, right, and he went he, be, he began to be blood hungry, and right, so he would you know go around uh, the the land trying to conquer 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 because he became hungry for power, and that is not at all true. Of course, you know that is not at all true. Right, but the difference between Mecca and Medina very I mean of course obviously right, is that now Medina has become a center. Right for the Muslims, it has become a town. It has become a a a place whereby you can establish governance, right, and you can establish rules, and you can establish economy. Right? A lot of things come into place when it comes to the marhala of Medina. When you come into Medina, a lot of things come into place. So it's for, important for us to understand, right, the societal 
uh, changes, right? And also the way Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam right, would conduct himself with his followers, with those who believe in him, right? So while in Mecca, because they were being oppressed. Right, and they were being shut up, and the majority was dis- were disbelievers. Right, of course, Islam cannot uh, show itself out, you know, in, in a large scale because you know you're, you're the minority. Uh, you have to be you know uh, wise about this matter. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala did not even give the permission for them to fight when they were in Mecca. And we mentioned before the three, the three different you know situations right uh, uh, of societies uh, in Mecca, whereby you are under the governance of a a uh, non-Muslim government that that is oppressive onto the believers. Right? That is one type of society right? where the Muslims are being oppressed under uh, uh, non-Muslims and they are basically harsh about it. Then in Habisha, in Abyssinia, you have the situation whereby the Muslims are in the governance of uh, non-Muslims who are fair. Right? They are fair non-Muslims, they are not uh, oppressive uh, and they allow the Muslims to live and to practice their religion you know, as they can. And that is the Habsha, the Abyssinia scene. Right? In Medina, you have the scene where the governance is the other Muslims. Right? The Muslims are, uh, make up the government, right? And then you have non-Muslims that live in the, within the, uh, the the community of Muslims. So you have three different situations going on. So you cannot just you know like as we reflect on Sira and reflect on our lives now in 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 this modern day that you just take the Medinan uh, period and you try to apply what was applied there into Singapore. Uh, situation because we are obviously not a Muslim government, right? But we are under a non Muslim government that is more or less fair, right? It is a fair government that allows you to practice your religion, right? To an extent, there are parts in this uh, society that's not allowed to practice your religion, then it is on us to avoid those parts, right? That's all, right? As easy as that, right? Avoid those parts, try, try, I mean, try your best to avoid where you're not allowed to practice, avoid it, right? And then go to where you're allowed to practice, and there are many doors, and Allah will open up the doors for you. Right, so basically, it's not an oppressive government, right? More or less, right? It is, you know, uh, uh, they have their, they have their laws, right? So, and we chose, and we choose to live here, and we choose to live here. And when you live, choose to live in a place, you choose to subscribe yourself to the laws of the place, right? and that is, uh, uh, basically what, uh, logically speaking, what it is about. So as we go into Mecca, right, and we leave, as we go into Medina, and we leave the Hijra. And we need to reflect on this hijra, and we need to really it is this hijra is something that is so, uh, it is it has it changed the entire uh, spread of Islam. This hijra, it is pinnacle, right? It is uh, uh, it changes the entire da'wah, right? This hijra, which is why the Sahaba counts the years from the year of the hijra because it is the most important event that happened. The disbelievers know it, the Muslims know it, right? It is obvious that this hijra was, you know, the most important event. And for us to reflect before we go into Medina, before I go into Medina, I want to take a step back, go back into the hijra. Right? And for us to reflect, because not just to go through the stories and we know about Surah Qab and Malik, we know about the spider, we know about the the, 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 the the pigeons, we know about the disbelievers, we know about the, the strategies, we know about the, the planning. That's all on the outward. Right? On the outward. As Muslims, as believers, we're not learning the his, the, 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 the Sirah as a history uh, book. That is not it. Right? We're learning the history. We're learning, we're learning the, 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 the Sirah right? for us to actually get emotionally involved. Right, with the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because we're believers, we're believers. We're not people who are in the university who are learning, you know, Islam one on one and going into the life of the Prophet Muhammad right, and looking at this identically. That's not what we're doing. We're doing that, right? But as believers, we cannot deny ourselves of the emotional attachment and the emotional uh, engagement right, with what is going on with the Sirah, right? Which is why it is important that for me personally, before I come for class, I will always go through, you know, by myself to let myself immerse. Right, in this and to understand and to, and to reflect and to imagine and to bring yourselves there into that cave. Right, when you understand to be in that cave and, you, and he is the best of human beings. The best of human beings sleeping on rock. Right, on, on a hard rock right, for three nights in a cave. Right, that is not the most comfortable of places right, to spend your nights. Right, he is fleeing right, from, from, the, from the hands of the, of the crooks. Right, and of course we don't say that Rasulullah is afraid of them, he's not at all afraid of them. 
uh, but it's basically the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he has to go to a different place because Islam needs to take flight right Islam needs to expand right? and being in Mecca is stifling right the expansion of Islam right so Medina was was crucial so you understand that when and and and, and you for us to put yourself in the shoes of Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu anhu Right when 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 Rasulullah SAW said to him, "Sleep, O Ali," and if you remember the hadith, "Nim ya Ali, right, O Ali, sleep." Right, fifirashi hada. Right, in my in this in this in this uh, bed of mine, right, and take my burda, right, my 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 cloak, right, and cover yourself with it, right, so that they can see that there is someone in the bed. On the outward, you see this as as a uh, a plan from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but from the inward meaning, how did Sayyidina Ali feel? How did Sayyidina Ali feel when he covered his entire body with the cloak of who? And whose cloak is that? It's the cloak of Rasulullah SAW, smelling of who? Smells of who? It smells of Rasulullah SAW. If you all have ever loved anyone very strongly, if you loved anyone very strongly, right, and you hold the blanket that has their scent, right, especially when they have passed, and when they have gone, and when you hold the blanket that has their scent, right, it, will, it will stir up emotions in you right, because it reminds you of the person that you actually love. So Rasayna Ali, he's now in this blanket. And Rasulullah Sallam is going to migrate right, and he's covering himself right, in, this, in this cloak of Rasulullah This is the, what the believer sees. We don't see strategy, just we see that. Right, but we see something deeper. We see Sayyidina Ali, well, how did he feel? That night, right? when you kick out his whole body with the cloak of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that is enough to say, you know, enough as, a, as an honor for him. Sayyidina Ali, your whole body is covered with the cloak of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, khalas, for him paradise. <laughs> right? There is no way that that person could ever enter the hellfire. Right? His whole body, his, his flesh, right? his skin with the cloak of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, uh, enveloped up, right? placing his body there, in, you know, exposing himself. And, and it could be that these believers come in and without checking who it is, kill him. It could very well be. Basically, he's putting himself as bait. He is, he is the bait. He is there for them to focus on. Because thinking that Rasulullah is still there while Rasulullah has fled. Like giving him a head start, going the other way. So nobody will see him going the other way. And subhanAllah, Sayyidina Ali. So you bring yourself to that position and you think, subhanAllah, how was it, Sayyidina Ali? How was it? How young was he? And how He was in his 20s, eh? Right, not 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 an old man. Eh? he's in his twenties. Sayyidina Ali, he's a young man, unmarried, and he's going to get married later on in, in Medina. Sayyidina Fatima Zahra, young man, bachelor. Right, you know, sitting there with the amana of Rasulullah Sallam, by the side to to have to give back. Right, then after after it was found out that it was him, spend the night in the in the in the cloak of Rasulullah Sallam. Was he sleeping? I doubt so. <laughs> I doubt he was sleeping, right? He was basically just, you know, like just sniffing, right? The scent of Rasulullah Sallam all night. And right? any one of you have ever smelled his scent? Subhanallah, Subhanallah. He's, it's like none other. It's like none other. If you ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? and Habib, you know, actually, I want to actually record all his duas during his sirah lessons, especially towards the end. Right? He will make a lot of dua, right? Which, which I can, I can capture, you know, in my writing, you know, because of the way, because he goes into a state. Right, and he will always do uh, you know, ask Allah to, to, to let you smell his scent. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask Allah you know, to let you see his face. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's not it's not beyond Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not beyond. And Rasulullah sallallahu he loves his ummah for as long as they follow him. And even if and even if they are sinners, right, he still loves them and he makes dua for them. Right, so this is what the believer does. The believer is not learning sirah for facts. That's not what we're doing. Right, we're trying with we, we, as as believers, as lovers of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We're learning the sirah so as to really get into this. It goes into our blood, into our veins. We memorize the facts, and we memorize it not for us to show off, but we memorize it because because when you love someone so much, you memorize everything about that person. Memorize. Right? We learn the lineage. We memorize the lineage. I hope you all have memorized the lineage. Right? We learn, you know, uh, uh, his basically his rough sirah. When he was well, how old his mother passed away. When he was how old his father passed away. His grandfather passed away. We learn everything. We memorize it. I hope you're memorizing. Memorize sirah of love. Right? Because you need to know about your beloved in your veins, in your fingertips. You need to speak about him. Because how can you spread about your beloved if you don't know him? You know, on your fingertips. You don't know about him, you know, just like that. And people say something to you about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then you shake. And then you, you, you be uncertain. You're not so sure. You don't know. Right? But whereas if you learn him properly, you know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will, will ennoble you with a deep understanding and a deep attachment. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, that blood that is mixed with love for me will never touch the, the fire of hell. I, or, or in the same meaning. Or the fire of hell is haram on the blood that is mixed with love for me. Right? And that is our, that is our ghaya. You know, that is our, our goal, our purpose. Right? Uh, the, the whole point of sirah is it, not for us to just know all these facts. Right? Because it, how many disbelievers know all these facts? How many? There are many orientalists out there who know all these facts. Plenty in all the universities in the world. When they have Islam 101, they speak about the sirah, of course. How many disbelievers will, will read all these things and it just goes past them as a biography of a great man? And that's all it is to them. Right? And then, and then there's, there's a loss. There's a big loss. You, know, you have the greatest human being ever created. Not about human being, the greatest creation ever created. And it's surpassing the angels. Right, surpassing the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, surpassing everything. And we believe that. We believe that. Rasulullah SAW surpasses everything in paradise. It's above all of that. Which is why his, 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 his mosque, the original mosque, that we're going to go into the building of the original mosque, Masjid Nabawi, that's called a part of heaven on earth. And in fact, it's the greatest part of heaven on earth. It's the greatest part of heaven of heaven. Uh, even heaven is less than that. I used to, when I was young, when someone told me that Rauda is in a part of heaven on earth, I used to think it's a lesser part of heaven on earth. No. As you learn more, it is the greatest part. Why? Because it carries the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It holds the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which heaven does not have. Right? Heaven does not hold the body of Rasulullah sallam yet. <laughs> right? So, so right now, the greatest part on this earth is that part in Medina on earth that holds the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we believe that. Right, and we know that and we have yaqeen and we and, 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 and this time we, we run to Medina. And right, Medina is not at all part of the rights of Hajj wa no Umrah at all. And you can do Hajj and Umrah without ever step, stepping foot in Medina. You could. Sahih. Right, it is a very Hajj and very Umrah Umrah. Right, but it is the rights of the ones who claim love to go and visit the one that you claim to love. If you're in the precincts. You can't be in Mecca and then you skip Medina. <laughs> You can't do that, right? If you, if you claim to love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you need to go to his house. You need to go to him, right? And give his, and give, and, and visit him with your salams. And then when you go into the, the cave, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and we imagine, we imagine Sayyidina Abu Bakr in the cave. Of course, we see the facts, right? But how was it, Ya Abu Bakr? How was it, you know, a full week alone with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sitting in the cave with him sleeping next to you? Right, worried, uh, these believers come, right, and then they and you hear their voices, and you're scared, and you're you know smile, and and your and your beloved, all he says is that wa ya Abu Bakr, right? What do you think, O Abu Bakr? Bi isnain, Allah thalithuhuma, right? By two, Allah is the third. And the ulama say, reflect on this, on this statement, right? It is a great statement if you understood. If you understood when someone says, right, what do you think of two when Allah is the third? Right, it's, you know, you just sit there and you just reflect. And that's what we're supposed to do as, 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 as human beings. Allah gives us an aql. And this aql is for us to sit down, look at things, read things, reflect on things. Not just go on and memorize, memorize, memorize and not, not process. Right? Processing is something that is so unfortunately removed from our addiction system. Right? Unfortunately, because it's so much for us to memorize and regurgitate. Right, that we don't process anymore. Right, and processing is the, is, is the crux of education. Right, that you actually sit and you, you absorb information and you process. And when you process, it changes you. When you don't process, then you are not. So you have people learning sirah, learning hadith, learning tafsir, and they are the worst of human beings. Right, because the information comes in and it, it is thrown out. And they, they could be teachers, they could be asatiza, they could be mashayikh, they could be whatever. Right, but the information does not come into their hearts. Right, and makes it shake, right, and make them understand. You know, am I a hypocrite? Am I as how I teach? Am I as how I say? That's called no processing. It's called you know on the tongue, give out to the to the ears that are around you. It's not go down to the heart and go into the hearts that are those who are around you. Right? Subhanallah. You know, this this is just to to, to 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 imagine Sayyidina Abu Bakr in that cave. And when you hear your beloved say, "What do you think of two? And it's him and Rasulullah Sallam. Allah is your third. If anyone said that to me. <laughs> Subhanallah is my Allah is your third. That means you're on the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can ever speak against Sayyidina Abu Bakr after that? Who can talk bad about him after that? Right? Saying that he's in the, in, the, in the group of three, which is Allah, Rasulullah, and Sayyidina Abu Bakr. 
Right, they are together. Right, and in La Tahzan, Inna Allah Ma'ana. Right, don't, and the, the famous, the famous quote of Rasulullah do not be sad. La Tahaf, Inna Allah Ma'ana. Don't be afraid, don't be sad. Oh, Abu Bakr, don't be grieved. Allah is with us. Don't, don't, don't shake, Abu Bakr, don't shake. Right, don't, don't be uncertain about this, this matter. I mean, the whole hijrah is covered. And Allah should over and over again, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm over you all. I can bring them right up to the door of your cave and they won't look down. <laughs> they won't. They are right there and they won't look down. Right, they will, they, and in fact, they will think, where did the footsteps go? Either into the cave or up the sky. Right, or down into the earth. In some way, right? you know, either the earth swallowed them up or they went up to the sky or into that cave. There was three possibilities. And they didn't even bother going for the most logical one. <laughs> There was only one logical one out of the three. Up into the sky, the earth swallowed them, or they went to the cave. <laughs> and you would think, look into the cave. <laughs> like, I, mean, I don't think they flew up to the sky, nor did they get swallowed by the earth, and a sudden earthquake or something. Right? But the most logical one, they went to the cave. Look, they didn't even occur to them. They didn't even occur to them. Khalas, who stopped that? Like, who removed it from their minds? Hey, for us, you know, so when you reflect, you begin to, to, all, to, to be at all with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the realization of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what, this is why we learn from our mashayikh. Right? This is all, it's not from me, it's from Habib. <laughs> it's from Habib. <laughs> right? It's why we learn from our mashayikh. They, they, they pull you on the path. It's called irshad. Right? It's called guidance. It's not called information. Not, not just, you know, uh, flat out knowledge or dry knowledge. No, it's guidance. That's what sirah is about. And when you go with Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and, and there was once uh, Sayyidina Umar during his Khalifa, right? And, and he came into the mosque, and the people, they were like, they were, they were praising Sayyidina Umar and his virtues and his merits and what he has accomplished and whatsoever. And Sayyidina Umar turned to them, and Sayyidina Umar said, One night of Abu Bakr, right? This one night of his life is better than Umar and the family of Umar and the entire lifespan of Umar. Right, and he said that one day of Abu Bakr's life is better than the, than Omar and the family of Omar and the whole lifespan of Omar. Right, and what is that one night? That one night is in the cave. Right, that one night, nothing, nothing that I have accomplished in my life can 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 ever come close right to the level of that one night. They say that Abu Bakr was with Rasulullah So you need to taste this, right? Reflect with yourself and taste this. Like how was that one night? Sayyidina Abu Bakr with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they were in the cave. Right? It was a sharaf, it was a nobility. Right? It was, you know, how was it? What did they talk about? This is why they say that Sayyidina Abu Bakr has secret knowledges. He learned many things from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he kept to himself. Right? Because they had secret time together, right? P- private time together. That cave, I mean, three days, what did they talk about? What did he witness in that cave? Right, when Rasulullah recites the Quran and when he stands in prayer, and he, you know, you, you, you don't know, right? There's a secrecy that happened there. Right, Rasulullah has secret parts in his life that only some Sahaba see, and they don't spread what they saw. Right, Subhanallah. Right, and then, and then the, 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 the day whereby Sayyidina Abu Bakr, that one day, right, whereby Sayyidina Umar's whole life and his family and his entire uh, this of Sayyidina Umar cannot, cannot compete with, with that one day is the one day after the death of Rasulullah wasallam. Right, when everybody was on the opinion that we should not fight those who refuse to pay zakat and Sayyidina Abu Bakr he stood up he stood up him by himself there was nobody else backing him up and everybody else was on the opinion that don't fight them they're still Muslims you cannot fight Muslims Sayyidina Abu Bakr he stood up and he says that zakat right, is on the level of prayer you refuse zakat it's as if you refuse prayer you refuse prayer you are murtad and you have left this religion if you refuse to, uh, to acknowledge the compulsion of prayer Right, so those who are not acknowledging the compulsion of zakat, right, they have come into the same level as those who have not have who refuse to acknowledge the compulsion of prayer. Therefore, illa bil haq, we fight them, right? Because Sayyidina Umar said, "Don't fight those illa ilaha illallah." Right? And he quotes the hadith, and Sayyidina Umar he continues the hadith as illa bil haq, illa bil haq, except by a right, except by a right, because the hadith says, "Do not fight those who who say la ilaha illallah." I mean, the the the, the, the blood. Of those in la ilaha illallah is haram or new, but the hadith goes illa bil haq, except in right. Right, Sayyidina, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Omar quote the first part, Sayyidina Abu Bakr quoted the second part. Right, he said illa bil haq. Right, and, we, and he said, Abu Bakr said, I will fight even for one sheep right, that is the right of the Muslim by zakat. And right, he will even fight people for that. 
right? Because it is the haq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not on us, right, to, uh, to, 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 to excuse. It's not our right to excuse. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's right is zakat. Right? So that day, when Zainal Abu Bakr was firm on the sharia, right, when everybody else wavered, Right, after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, thinking right, that it is better that we take a step back and we don't, you know, you know clamp down on them. So Nabi Muhammad said, "No, we clamp down and we fight, and we fight because they refuse. These people are, are Muslims; they refuse the zakat. Right? So, so and, and and of course, his. We will go into the story when we go and come to the death, after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as to how that impacted right, uh, the, 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 the the ummah after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the the tribes around Mecca, around Medina. The rest of Ramadina, they they if they said to Sayyidina Abu Bakr when he was the first Khalifa, right? They said that, well, now Rasulullah is no longer around, and we only pay our zakat to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're not going to pay to you, right? <laughs> so that was their excuse. And had Sayyidina Abu Bakr taken the opinion of Sayyidina Umar and others to not fight them, right? More of them will begin to refuse zakat, right? Well, because he clamped down, because they saw that oh, now Rasulullah Sallam is 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 gone. The 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 the, the, the Medina, which is the which is the capital for the Muslims, is now weak, because their main leader is gone, right? It's now Abu Bakr, and oh, we can we can push Abu Bakr around. I mean, he's not he's not strong, right? They, they, we can bully him around, right? No, so Abu Bakr stood up for it, for it. So that 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 clamped down, you know, and they they all went back into, uh, the Taubat, right? It caused all of them to Taubat, right? Had he not done that, it would have spread, this facade, right? it would have spread to the land, and people refused to pay zakat. Right, because zakat is difficult on, on them. <laughs> zakat is money. <laughs> right, and money is difficult. Right, so subhanAllah. So, so subhanAllah, the uh, Sayyidina Muhammad. Right, so the wealth of uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Alhamdulillah. And how, how was the stay of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right in uh, the, the cave? One thing I did not mention last week was that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, when he was in the cave, and they saw the spider, and there were the the, 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 the pigeons, right? They had the eggs there, right? And because of these this animals that were there, right, they, they left, saying that, you know, how could someone be in the cave when there are pigeons and, and she's nesting? You know, when she's nesting, meaning there's nobody there, right? Because, you know, the way pigeons are, right? And then there's a spider's web there, and, you know, if someone went in, the spider's web would have broken. Of course, you know, it shows their lack in understanding that you're speaking about a prophet, <laughs> you know, and, and, if, if, and, and he's a prophet, therefore, all animals and all forces of nature, right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God would subject to his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, without any doubt, right? Of course, you know, Allah blinded them, right, and they went off. Right, it was said that the, I mean, in some narrations, it said that the pigeons that came, there were two of them, right, that are, after the disbelievers left, right, they came to the mouth of the cave. Right, and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reached out, right, and he stroked them, right, to thank them <laughs> right, for what they have done, right. No, and of course, and the, the snake that was in the cave you mentioned, right, the snake actually smelled the smell of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he was trying to come out, right, and he bit on Sayyidina Al Bakr three times, right, because he was like, no, this foot here, <laughs> I need to get out and see Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's in my cave, <laughs> you know, like, like I need to honor my guest. <laughs> Someone's foot is here. <laughs> right, so I mean, so these animals, I mean, the animals all, you know, they love Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, so Rasulullah he 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 is mentioned. Habib, Habib mentions the story. It's not found in the books, yeah, but Habib mentions this. Right, he, I know, we love learning from them, you know, because they say stuff that you will never find anywhere else. <laughs> right, because for them, their knowledge is handed down. Right, so because they are they are from the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, so the stories all go all the way up to Sayyidina Fatima Zahra. To Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? So it's, it's father to child, father to child, father to child, all the way up to the Fatima Zahra, right? That is their senate. Their senate is it is by by sheikh to student and also family, father to child, right? So as as the father would teach the children, so Sayyidina Han, Sayyidina Hussein, and as they go down, 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 and all the way down to the Sadat, right? So Subhanallah, which is why there's a hadith by towards the end of time, hold on to the book of Allah subhanahu wa taala and to my family, to my family. Right, meaning those who descend from Rasulullah Sallam, specifically the scholars amongst them, the scholars amongst them, right, and that's why we're holding on right to them because they, they have a, they, they they understand things, right? Because for them it's just it's just family, you know. Like they're talking about their grandfather here, right? No one else. It's just their grandfather. We talk about Sayyidina Abu Zahra. It's their grandmother, right? It's no one else. So they know about their grandfather. They know about their grandmother. They know very well, right? So uh, so he said that uh, so the uh, Rasulullah stroked the heads of the pigeons. Right, and told them to go back to Mecca. 
Uh, and it is mentioned, you know, in narrated that uh, the pigeons that are, that are there in Mecca today are descendant from these two pigeons. Right? And there are a lot of pigeons there. Uh, and it's also mentioned by the ulama that pigeons tend to flock right, to places whereby there are angels. And this is why in Singapore, you rarely see pigeons... But when you go to Makkah, Habib, no, they're everywhere. <laughs> and they're just flocking there. Right? You know, and really, pigeons, they, they really flock, flock to places whereby there are a lot of angels. Right? That's how you see, you know, there's the signs. So Makkah, Medina, oh, everywhere, everywhere, the pigeons. Subhanallah, subhanallah. Right? So, alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. The snake came out and gave you salam and you went off. <laughs> you want to see that's a lot of fun. That's all. That's all. Put his foot there. So he just bite lah. <laughs> bite again. <laughs> and then keluar kan venom lagi. <laughs> I mean, he let out his some venom. He could have just given a nip, right? <laughs> He's like, if I give a nip, he won't move his foot. Bite. <laughs> and 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 give him some venom. So he moves his foot <laughs> three times. So the three times bite. Like Habib said, three times he bit the heel of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just tahan. He held it. Like he just, he just, oh, he just bore with it. <laughs> and he began to weep because now he has sacrificed his foot for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How great is that? I go my foot, you know, and sacrifice my foot for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they love whenever they are able to sacrifice for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. So Subhanallah, you know that. When we think about all these people and how they have sacrificed for us, so Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Um Ayman, you know, later on she will come for the Hijrah. We must think, you know, for ourselves, you know, what, what have we done? Right? And, and of the most beloved thing to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that you spread the message. There is the, there's something more beloved to him than that. Right? That you spread the message right, of the worship of the one true God. You spread the message of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You discourage people from disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you spread the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In however, in however way you could do this, right? Just do it, right? It is the most, it is the most beloved thing to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nothing brings more joy to his heart than to hear someone come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or hear someone come into the fold of Islam. Right, so either it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, right? But a Muslim who comes close, even a step closer. So one tawbat, one istighfar, one more prayer, one more, no, at least one step. And right? nothing brings more happiness to the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. All right. Alhamdulillah. All right. So so we are now right. We have actually reached Masina Muhammad. So now we have actually reached um, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has reached Quba. Right, that's where we are at. Eh? That's where we are at. He has reached Quba, and he spends four nights in the Quba, right? And he builds the first mosque that was established with taqwa at Masjid Quba. Right, you can visit the mosque when you go to Medina. Right, so the first mosque, and you should visit all these mosques. As a mosque that we mentioned before, they are they are built with taqwa, they are built on halal wealth, they are built with the greatest of intentions. So you go to Medina, right? It is highly recommended, and you should. Right? Uh, if, what else do you do in Medina? You know, right? in Medina, go and visit the athar, right? The remnants, what is what is left behind, right? Because it's your beloved, right? You know, when you look when you look at the story of Laila and Majnun, you know, if you know the story, right? my husband has a story book. The story of Laila and Majnun. If you are interested like, to know about them, you know, because they are always quoted. They, they, they are like the Romeo and Juliet of you know of Islam. But of course, their story is very different, right? Laila and Majnun. Laila is a is a woman, and Majnun is uh, he's called Majnun because he's crazily in love for Laila. Right? But the ulama always quote them, right? Because the way Majnun expresses his love for Laila, right? That is how the ulama or those who who you know those those those, those who, the people of of tasting. They would express their love for Rasulullah and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Majnoon, you know, once he uh, he saw he was seen uh, being good to a dog. There was a dog. Right? That he was seen, you know, giving food, you know, looking after the dog, giving water and everything. And they say, Oh Majnoon, why are you you know, why are you so uh, uh, caring towards this dog? Right? And he said that I once saw this dog in the vicinity of Laila. Right? And by by just that the dog reminded me of Laila. So I, I, I you know, I honor the dog. 
right? So this is, this is basically a, it's all parables. It's all parables. So whatever you see of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And 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 there was once you know Majnun was to quote it to, to was was seen, you know, going around in a room, right? And he kissed this wall and he kissed that wall and he kissed the walls, right? And then he was said, it's not the walls, it's not the walls that I'm kissing. Right, but it was the person who was who was housed in these walls, right? That I am yearning for. So you know, this is this is what it is when you go to Medina. That's what it is. And you go to this place, and you go to this to this to this mosque, and you go to Uhud, and you go to the Masjid Nabawi, you go to the Rauda, right? You go to all these places, right, in Medina, right? And you kiss here, and you think here, and you sit down, and you reflect. Right, and you and you and you and you think about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's like that. It's how Majnun was. Right? It's not about these places. It's not the places. Right? The places are there. Right? Because they they connect you to your beloved. It's about the beloved. It's about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's all it is. Right? That's why we go to these places, and that's why we 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 we, we sit there right? and we visit them. Right? Because we want we go to Masjid Qubba. Right, how was it, Ya Rasulullah? Right, when you entered in the Qubba and the people of Medina, they actually ran out. There were those from Medina who went out to Qubba. Right, if you have seen the, the map, right? So Qubba is down here. Right, Medina is here. See that? Right, so there is just a bit of a distance. Right, and, but he settled there first in Qubba. Right, and the people of Medina, of course, when they heard that Rasulullah is already there, right, they came out. Right, they came out and they went to see him. And they, one by one, they began to say the salam to Rasulullah wasallam. Right, so for us, you know, one of, we, 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 we go for these traces. It's called the Athar. What, is, what has remained of our beloved. Right, for us, in trying to get something of the beloved. Right, so when you know like, of water that has the... the, the the you know uh, the bekas of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the remnants of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we go for this kind of water and we drink this water there ah you you want you want some yeah, yeah. bring next time <laughs> in my house eh Habika didn't brought that time Habika brought that time yeah so she gave some of one of my, uh, our sisters and she shared with us. Right. So and, and, and think about it is that blessings, right, they, they, they increase when you share. Right. So don't think that you know when I have like some water, right? That is that is from a source of some that when I keep pouring water over it, I'm diluting it. No. You're actually increasing the blessing. You're actually strengthening the blessing. Right, that's in the water. Right? I don't think that you know, oh is this is the amount that was original when I pour and then it gets diluted, you know. It's not the way, right? It's like like if you if you if you study homeopathy Right, so the homeopathy, if you know what it is, science of homeopathy, right? That for them, in that science, right, the more diluted, the stronger the effect. Right? So and I believe that about baraka also. I and mean, water, water, the more diluted, right, the more the purer the energy, right, that is kept in the molecules of the water. Allah, you know, Allah, Allah knows. Right? So which is why that when you have uh, water that is uh, blessed, right, it is on you to actually keep keep it, right, not let it run out. I right, keep pouring water on it, right, and then sharing with people who are around, right, because water that there is water is able, alhamdulillah, water is able to capture blessings, right, in water, right. So subhanallah, so we are made of water, right. So when you use this water, everything that like, there there is an effect on you, right. Subhanallah. So guess okay, so I am drinking. <laughs> no, these are handed down. They are handed down by Sahaba, you know. So these are people who have who have line. Right, most of them they will have it. Yes, yeah, so because they, I mean, if they see the Sahaba, or say na say na Fatima, say na Ali, they had some. They would have mixed it, right, and passed to their children. And the children would have mixed it and passed to the children and passed down and passed down and passed down and passed down. Right, there was a convert story when uh in in the UK, right, my friend's cousin, one of my friend's cousin, her he passed away, right. But basically, he was a convert, and it was mentioned that at his at his funeral, right? Someone came with a small, uh, like a vessel, you know, a small test tube, that kind of thing, right? And and at his janaza washing, right? After they have finished washing it, washing him, they like, okay, pour this over his body. This is the, um, the remnants of the wudu water, of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yeah, like we need to get our hands on these things. <laughs> Right, I mean, it's one a lot. They exist till today. Of course, they exist till today. Would any of the Sahaba let it run dry? 
Would any of the tabi'in let it run dry? Tabi'in, tabi'in. Would any of those who have been entrusted with this water let it run dry? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. They will hold it to the end of their lives and pass on to their children. And they will pass down. It's ex- they still exist. Still exist. And the hair of Rasulullah. All these things all still exist. Right. Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to have these things. So, so when he reached... Alright. So... <laughs> So when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam reached Quba, right, and he spent four nights right, in uh, Quba, you know, some stretch on to to fourteen nights in Quba. Allahu alam, right? It's between, you know, there's, there's entire uh, debate or khilaf, right, about how long Rasulullah sallam was in Quba. Right? Basically, he stayed there right, with some of the people in Quba, right, and then he entered into Al Madinah. And when he entered into Al Madina, right, uh, Madina is called Yathrib, right, and with the coming of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's called Madina to Nabi, which means the city of the Prophet, Madina to Nabi. Right? But of course, short form, Al Madina, right, the city. Right? It just means the city, right. So, okay, the name was changed, and thereafter, it was not to be called Yathrib ever again, right. So, when they entered into Medina, right, of course, when they were, they, before they came in, right, they had uh, Zubair, Sayyidina Zubair, right, which is the uh, Sayyidina Zubir bin Awam Which is the nephew of Sayyidina Khadija ah, Yes, the nephew of Sayyidina Khadija He actually met Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam In Quba right? And he was a trader right? And he had some uh, clothing with him So he gave Sayyidina uh, uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam White thobes right? So they, they came fresh you know, From Quba So Quba they kind of freshened up you know, <laughs> Before they came into Medina So they were all freshened up And they were glowing right? So when they came into Medina right, And they were both on their camels Right, the people of Medina, every, I mentioned before last week, and that every day they would come out, right, and they would climb up the, 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 the palm trees and they would search. They would look out for a source of, until the heat was unbearable and they would come down. Right? So, so, actually there was, so the day where some came into Medina, the Jews as she saw, right, the, Jew, the, the Jews saw from far or saw some coming, right, and, and the Jews, they, 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 they screamed up to the Arabs and said, that, Oh, Arabs, right, your, you know, your, your man is here, your guy is here, you know, he has come uh, towards Medina. So they all began running out right, of their houses right, to, to, to meet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And at points, you know, Abu Bakr realized that the people of Medina, having not seen Rasulullah before, right, that they would, they would not know which of the two men was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because Sayyidina Abu Bakr is supposed to be younger than Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he had white hair. Well, Rasulullah Sallallahu at that point had no white hair. Right, his hair came, came later in his life. Right, but Rasulullah is about two years and plus, almost three years, two, two years and a few months older than Sayyidina Abu Bakr. But Sayyidina Abu Bakr was really greying. Right, Rasulullah was not greying yet, so he looked younger. So Sayyidina Abu Bakr was, 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 was you know, worried that people might, might go and try start, start to you know, welcome him. <laughs> He's not the Prophet. <laughs> right, so, so he took off his reda, right, his, his shawl, and he began to shade Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So people know that he's the Prophet. <laughs> and I'm just the, the servant. <laughs> I'm just the one next to him. Right, so people, they knew. From there, they saw that, that uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr was the um, the, the companion and Rasulullah was the prophet. Right, so of course, when he came in, right, uh, uh, Rasulullah he became of, of the first few words that has been narrated of what uh, Rasulullah said. This was narrated from Sayyidina Abdullah bin uh, Salam, right? Of the he is of the we mentioned his story before also, right? He is of the uh, the the. The learned men of the Jews, so the rabbis, the rabbis of the Jews, where he came into Islam immediately. Did I mention sorry? Abdullah bin Salam. No. Where did I mention his story? The one that. I didn't. I did, can. Where? <laughs> okay, maybe not here. Alright, so maybe I mentioned somewhere else. Because his story is an amazing story about. Oh yeah, in Tafsi, in Tafsi. I mentioned in Tafsi. Because his story is an amazing story about the Jews. Right and uh, I'll I'll mention his story. Uh, basically, when he uh, when Muhammad Muhammad when Rasulullah came into Medina, right, and people all they were they were gathered around him, and you can imagine right now right now you want just bring yourself to that scene. Sayyidina Anna said, right, there was not a greater day, right, there was not a day that there was there was more joy and more light, more illumination. Than the day when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came into Medina, and the whole Medina was lit right, in bright light. Right. He came in a day. 
He came in the day, it was bright in the, in, the, in, the, in the afternoon, in the day, he came into Medina. So this, the whole Medina was lit right? and everybody was coming out, everybody was rejoicing. Right? It was, you see, this, this whole, you know, subhanAllah, he just left his town where people chased him out. <laughs> he just left. He was, he's, a, he's a wanted man, a hundred camels on his neck. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And he comes into a city By the whole city has come out Right To welcome him Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Subhanallah And this one thing I wanted to mention That I forgot That before he left Medina Rasulullah sallallahu Before he left Mecca Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam When he was about to leave Mecca He turned back to Mecca Right He turned back to look To look at Mecca You see Because these people They are attached to the country They are attached to the place of birth and when you meet, you know, uh, uh, these people, even today, when you meet people who are native to the land, they have a love for their land unlike any other. We are not natives. <laughs> right? We are all children of immigrants, most of us. Right? We are descendants of immigrants. Right? So, when I, I remember when I was in, uh, I can't remember in Syria or in Yemen, whereby, you know, I, I was saying some, to one of my friends that I'm going back to my, and she was Arab, you know, and of the land, of the land. I said I was going back to my country. And she be like, it's nothing like your own country, right? And then she said to me, there's nothing like your own country. Right? You only feel, you know, comfortable and, and, and at peace in your own country. But in my heart, I was like, no, I like it here in Yemen. <laughs> right, but that is basically because we're not native. We're not natives. You know, we're not people of this land, or we're not the, the aborigines of the land. Right? We're basically immigrants. We're children of immigrants. So we don't understand the attachment that a person has Right, to the land of his forefathers. You know, the land that he was born in. He was born. We don't understand that because we don't, we don't experience that. And we can't. Because we're already, you know, we're divorced from our own original land, India, for me, India. Right, I've never been there in my life. <laughs> you know, right? So, yeah, so, and so we're not attached to that land. And this is basically, to us, it's a, it's a migrant land. Right? Our forefathers came here. And we could easily leave. Most of us to go to Malaysia, go to Indonesia. No, no problem for us. Because we're not attached. We're not attached, right? These people who are from the land, from the land, right? Like when when I spoke to my friends, you know, in Tarim, all that. When when and there is, there's a poem by one of the Habaib who came to Southeast Asia to do da'wah, right? But he would always yearn for Tarim, yearn for Tarim to go back to his origin land. And if you read the writings of Chinese who came here as immigrants, right, they will always also write about going back to China and dying there. Right, there's this thing about, about human beings and the homeland right, that is lost with the migrant population. <laughs> right, it's lost. We don't have it anymore. So I mentioned that because Rasulullah SAW, before he left Mecca, and he's about to go to Medina, you know, and people in Medina are you know, with open arms welcoming him. But he turned around to Mecca. And he said to Mecca, he spoke to Mecca, he said to Mecca, you know, I swear by Allah, you are the most beloved land to me. You're the most beloved. You spoke to my guy, you know, and the key, bilad ilayya. And you are the most beloved land to me. And had it not, he says, had it not been for your people driving me out, I would have never left you. And he spoke to Mecca. And then he turned and he, and he faced in the direction of Medina. And he, oh Allah, give Medina twice the blessing. If you have twice the blessings that you give, Mecca. And that's why if you ever go for Umrah and you go to Mecca, Medina, it's so different. Mecca, there's a huge difference like, in your heart when you go to Mecca and when you go to Medina. It's a huge difference that everybody will experience. It's not just one person, two person. You enter Medina, there's something else going on. <laughs> right? There's something else going on in Medina that was not in Mecca. Right? From the dua of Rasulullah alayhi wa sallam, and Rasulullah made lots of dua for in Medina and Medina was only from a, from a small agricultural town and they were nothing they were not mentioned by most people no one cared about Medina they were basically an oasis they had their agriculture mazra and they had their gardens whatsoever they had their, their, their farms there was something interesting the Jews were there <laughs> the Jews had set up the fortresses there and they were basically uh, controlling the financial situation of Medina <laughs> right, as they do everywhere they go right? they, they control the financial situation right? and they were basically you know, riba and loaning and whatever they were doing right? they were there that was, interesting about, that was the only interesting thing about Medina yeah. that the uh, Jews were there in the Jews still now in Saudi? in, uh, in I'm sure they are right? they're, they're around, they're around right? in Singapore there are some it's a population of Jews yeah, they are 
but you hardly find them. You see them, but they do exist in Singapore. They are one of the religions that are that is uh, recognized in Singapore. Right, so if you go to the, I think Masjid Anada, right? There's a interracial, interracial, uh, interreligious hub at Masjid Anada, right? So they are recognized as one of the religions here in Singapore. But I have not met Jews in Singapore. I've not met met them, met one. <laughs> I'm not. Oh. Oh, he's a Jew. But Judaism can be converted into, right? They don't like people coming into the religion. Because <laughs> ah, as far as I know, they, they are very, they're very much um, that you have to be of the blood. <laughs> you have to be of the blood to be of them. Uh, exclusively of the, of the Jewish blood. You know, uh, Bani Israel, basically. They don't like people entering the religion. Right? So they're not all about that. <laughs> One of them is not. They don't want you to come, come in. Because it's exclusive. You know, it's exclusive. Allah Alam, Allah knows. Right, but um, maybe there might be, there might be Jews still there. Right, but I know in, in the secret precincts, Makkah and Medina is Muslims. Right, Makkah and Medina in the secret precincts, right, there are no more uh, uh, disbelievers in these uh, two areas. Allah Alam. Right, so basically, Medina was a, like a nobody, lah, eh? like nobody. <laughs> like, not a big fancy place. No one would really go to Medina. You know, <laughs> and in fact, Medina had a disease there, malaria. Uh, it's said to be malaria, it's said whatever it is. Right? Basically, there was a disease in Medina that was described. Right? Sayyidina Abu Bakr got this disease, Sayyidina Bila got this, got this disease. Right? So, and of the Sahabas, quite a number of the Muhajirun, the people of Medina are immune to the disease. So, that the inhabitants of Medina have grown immune to the disease that's in Medina. Right? Uh, some of the scholars of our time say that it was malaria because Medina was an oasis town. Right? So, therefore, there was like mosquitoes and you know, like, a lot of these diseases lah that spread in Medina. So when the Muhajirun went to Medina, they fell sick. A lot of them fell sick. To the point whereby some of them would say death is better than the sickness. Because of the 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 the, the, the heaviness of the disease and then they the, 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 they they'll go they become delirious because of the fever. Right? And and Sayyidina Aisha narrates that she can she went into the presence of Sayyidina Al Bakr and Bilal when they were sick with this disease and they were in a high fever and they were both delirious. Right, they were talking nonsense and they were like, you know, because and they were like saying that death is better and because they were so sick, right? They were high, high fever. So she went to say to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I help the Muhajirun. <laughs> right, they, 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 they just, you know, they, they're so unwell <laughs> because of this disease from, um, um, from malaria right? and Rasulullah. Huh? So Rasulullah, he didn't get it, he didn't get it. Rasulullah doesn't fall sick. <laughs> it's very rare that he actually fell sick, right? Uh, towards the end of his life, then he began to fall sick. Right, to prepare the, dis- the, the, the prepare the believers f- for the parting, right? If Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but it was very rare that he actually fell sick. Right? It was very rare. Um, Allah alam, right? So basically, Sayyidina Aisha she came into the, the, the presence of Sayyidina Abu Bakr and, and uh, Bilal radiallahu anhu, right? And he asked Rasul, she, and she went to Rasulullah and she said, Ya Rasulullah, right? What's going on here <laughs> in Medina? Uh, and then Rasulullah made a dua, right? And here uh, the dua is here, right? So he said, Oh Allah. Right, uh, uh, he is a curse. Shaybah bin Rabi'ah, wa Atba bin Rabi'ah, wa Umayyah bin Khalaf. Right, so curse them, right, because um, they have they have they have driven us out of our land to a land that has a disease. Right, so first he began by that way, you know, because it's, and this and the, the, and Rasulullah usually does not curse people unless it has been revealed to him these people are doomed to die as his believers. Right, so he only would ever say it if he knows for sure that they will die as his believers. Right, so he won't like randomly curse uh, people unless he knows, you know, from Allah's knowledge that the people will die as his believers. And then he says, "Allahumma habib ilayna al Madina kahubina Mecca or Ashad, right? Wasahiha, right? So, oh Allah, make us love Medina as how we loved Mecca, right? or even more intense love." I will ask love it even even more than how we love Mecca. Because now the Muhajirun they are feeling this this strain, you know. You see, you have left your town, your beloved town, Mecca, your homeland. And most of the Muhajirun they love Mecca. There's a Kaaba there. Basically they, they, they like how some was they were attached to Mecca. They don't want to leave Mecca. They don't want to. Right? But there's no you know the, the command has come and now it's wajib for believers to leave Mecca. It's become wajib. So so the leaving of Mecca is not because they were being persecuted. 
because there were those who had strong tribes, you know, uh, backing them up. They didn't have to leave Mecca, and the leaving of Mecca was because the Muslims had to congregate in Medina, right, for the building of Islam. This is why it was compulsory for every believer to come to Medina, right, as far as they could. So it's not a matter of you know fleeing, like Habasha. At Habesha, at Bessinia, it was a matter of fleeing. If you can't take the persecution in Mecca, and the torture in Mecca, then flee. Flee to Habesha. But Medina was not a fleeing. And Medina was basically, we need this religion. It's, now it's the, the time has come for this religion to expand. And, and we need to have a base from which we expand. And that base will be Medina. So all Muslims congregate there. Right, because they're going to expand from there. So there's going to be education there. There's going to be uh, laws coming down, Sharia laws. There's going to be economy going on. There's going to be a lot of things that will structure society in Medina. So it was compulsory. It was wajib. The hijrah was wajib. And it was compulsory on those in Mecca to make the hijrah to Medina. So when they went to Medina, now they found that Medina is a, is a, is a, is a land of disease. <laughs> Right, and, and this is not any disease, it's terrible disease. If it was, if it was malaria, right, as some of the scholars of today say, you know, then this is terrible disease. That if you're not prepared for malaria, malaria can be, can, can be you know, uh, very harmful. And of course, we know in Singapore, I mean, uh, uh, death, right, malaria can be fatal if it's not, if it's not uh, cured or if it's not uh, handled well. Right, and we know in the Rasulullah Islam, what, what did they have? Right, they were just exposed to the disease and they go through the disease and they die. Right, and there also some of the some of the ulama say that that was what happened to the, the parents of Rasulullah SAW also. Allah Alam, Allah knows. Because both of them fell sick in Medina. <laughs> right, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Abdullah, the father of Rasulullah SAW, went to Medina to visit his paternal uh, uncle, straight from his uh, grandmother's side. Right, and he fell sick at night. His grave is in Medina. Then the mother of Rasulullah SAW went to Medina to visit her, her the grave of her, of her, of her husband. Right, and to bring Rasul Sam to his uh, paternal uncles, on their way out, she felt she was sick. Right, she got a disease. Right, and then she died on the way out. Right, so Allah wa'ala, you know, what it was that was in Medina that was causing this, uh, this difficulty. Right, so Rasul Sam, he says that, was sahiha, and rectify Medina. Right, fix Medina. <laughs> something, something going on in Medina. Right, wa barik fi sa'iha, wa, mad, wa, wa maddiha, wa nqal. وَنْقَلْ حَمَاهَا فَجْعَلْهَا بِالْجُحْفَ Right, and bless her, right, in just basically her, 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 her mountains and, her, and her, her open spaces, right, and, and remove and cause this fever, right, and move this fever from Medina to this place called Juhfa. Right, Juhfa is like a, like a um, they would say, uh, a swarmy area, right, a swamp, right, a swamp, swamp lah, swamp, <laughs> like a swamp. It's somewhere off of Medina. It's a, it's a different town altogether. But it's not a town. It's not a town. It's a swampy area. And so, the, the, so, 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 and it was seen in a dream. Right? There was a black woman, right? Uh, uh, in, so, 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 I'm sorry, in a dream. The black woman, right, got up from Medina and she walked out of Medina and she went to that place called Johfa. Right? So, she went there. Right? And, and there is the, 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 the understanding that Allah took this disease and Allah brought it over to Jofa, right? So, and of course, also of the what has been mentioned from the efforts of Rasulullah SAW was that he drained out the swamps around Medina. He drained it up, right? So, of the efforts, right? It was prevent mosquito mosquito um, uh, breeding, lah. Right? There's something going on in Medina, so there was the swamps were drained out, right? Uh, they set up their own marketplaces, right? So, Rasulullah was now going to establish a community in Medina. Okay, when he reached Medina, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When he reached, oh wait, what time are you supposed to end? Nine. Nine. Okay. <laughs> no, nine eh? okay, I keep forgetting when he's supposed to end. All right. So when Rasulullah sallam reached Medina, and here you have to understand, in Medina you have a community primarily of farmers, right? They are not rich, right? They're poor. <laughs> they're farmers. They're not traders. Meccans are richer. Because they are traders, right? They're businessmen, right? So the Meccans left all their stuff behind, right? And they migrated to Medina, and there's a lot of them, right? A lot of them. So you're not saying, you know, uh, well, you're not saying just like 10, 20, yeah? maybe about 100, you know, like, like you no, know, or less than that, maybe about 70, right? Meccans, right? From Mecca, right? Muhajirun, that came to Medina 
to settle in Medina and you have people of Medina who are not rich themselves, right? They're farmers, right? And now they have to open up their land for foreigners. Right? And most of us we're not happy to do so. Right. I mean people in our land, even in our own land, even in other people's all over the world, lah, all over the world. Most people are not happy opening up to foreigners. Which is why but it's not it's not right. It's not right. Because the, the land is our lost land. And and what is ironic is that it's not even our land. <laughs> and we're all migrants, right? So you know I mean the real people who are upset were the original, you know, Malays who were here from the beginning. They should be the upset. Why is that you guys came in and populated, <laughs> right? And now you're the majority. I which happened, you know, all over the world in America, in Australia, in you know, like whereby this this other race came in and populated. But it shouldn't be a problem. Because the land is Allah's land. And and Allah gives his land to whomsoever he wants. It's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So people of Medina, right now, what has happened? You have this huge population of people coming into Medina. When Rasulullah came to Medina, he began to do this, yata'akha. Yata'akha, that means to brother people to each other. And this was, even though the Muslims were already brothers right, by, in belief, right, so the, 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 the Muslims are already understood your brothers in Belief, right, in Iman, right, but he specifically named pairs, right, to brother, right, each other, right, so, so he will call an Ansar, if right, someone of the of people of Medina, so people of Medina are going to call them Ansar from now on, Ansar from the word Nasara means to help, right, so Ansar are the helpers, so they call the Ansar, and I will use that, this term, uh, uh, from now on, right, to refer to the people of Medina, and the Muhajirun are those who call, who did the Hijra. Right, so we're going to use Ansar and Muhajir. We must know who they are, right, in this dynamics in Medina. So Rasulullah would actually name a, per, a man from the Ansar and a man from the Muhajirun, right, and he will say, "You are brothers," right. It means now they are they, they are connected, right, by this brotherhood bond, right, and and he would do it with every Muhajir that came to Medina. So all the Muhajirun had a brother pair, right, with the Ansar. And when you look at this, it could be a sunnah, right, that it could be employed when foreign people or strangers come into a place whereby people are already together, right? So like in schools, in classrooms, in whatever, right? So if somebody, right, was, uh, was, 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 was strange, a stranger to this situation, and there were already people who are, who are there, right, it would be useful, right, or it would be of a sunnah, right, to actually pair people up. So that those who are already there, right, look after the one who is new, right. So see, look into his affairs, see how he is, see his, you know, and and all on top of my head lah. Just basically, when it comes to converts, also, it would actually be you know befriending, right, but befriending to a point like this lah, right, but you are actually brothers and sisters. It means like I will always every day check on you. I text you. Are you okay? Do you need anything from me? You know, like in the sense, you know, really serious, you know, pairing. Right, that that the point where the people of Medina and people of Makkah, right, the Ansar and the Muhajirun, when Rasulullah paid them up, right, they were of those who would you know bring his brother to his house and say to his brother, okay, you know what, I have uh, this is my my house, I have two houses, take one, nah, you know, take one house, right, I have this small cattle, take half, this is my farm, take half, right, so they would literally they would they would split everything they had into half. Right, and give their brother Muhajirun. Right, but then there was once, you know, one of the Sahaba, I can't remember his name right now, right, but his brother did that to him, right? His brother who brought him home and said, Okay, you know what? I have all this wealth, right? Take half of my wealth, lah, take, take. Right, and then he said that, No, 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 no. Right, but I am a trader, right, I am good with, with uh, business, I have, I, have a, I have a sharp mind for business. Show me the marketplace and I'll offer myself. I just need to show him where's the marketplace, right? So, so and, and, and true enough, he actually uh, grew his business. Right, wherever the marketplace is, the marketplace was. And there is also, you know, you see the, the, the sunnah of the refugee, right? Because sometimes that you see, now we are in a time where there's a lot of refugees, right, around the world. Right, Allah right? Uh, and, and refugee does not, like for example, people were complaining online, saying that the Syrian refugees all have phones and whatsoever. Right, and someone reported them saying that they're refugees. They're not, they're not, they're not uh, you know, uh, impoverished. They're refugees. That means they're run away from their life in, uh, in their land. Right, so which means that which is why when they, when they went to other countries, they began to build their own business because they are people who used to have business. Right, so when they go to another land, they begin to build. Of course they do, right? Because they're not used to sitting around and begging. 
they're not beggars right they but they're businessmen right they maybe they, they they have a they have a skill they have a, a trade they have whatsoever so they will they will do it again somewhere else <laughs> right that is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this creation right so the people of Mecca were like that right they have a question right you know yeah Iman. <laughs> it's a good question. Like, well, how come it was so easy for them to give? Iman. It was Iman. They, the Ansar, and this is the amazing thing about the Ansar. First and foremost, they opened up the doors. You know, they, have, they had nothing to do with the situation of Rasulullah SAW and the Meccans. And there were people around Mecca who had become Muslim. But none of them actually like, you know, come to our place. <laughs> you know, like none of them did that. The people of Medina were the ones who invited the Muslims over. Come. Right? You, like, you know, it's, it's hard here. Come to our place. They opened up their doors, people of Medina. Of course, we know that they, from, from before we mentioned, they were prepared by the Jews. <laughs> right? The Jews actually informed them about the, the, the signs of the last prophet. So when they saw him, they had no doubt it was him. No doubt. So they were pre- being being groomed by the Jews to accept Rasulullah SAW. Then from there, the Iman came to their hearts. Right? And they must understand the Ansar, they have an Iman. Right? And they were of the, the Sabiqun and Sabiqun. And they are of the, you know, the, for, the foremost, you know, the, who, who run towards, towards goodness. So, the, so when we go into this part of, this, of Sira, we must understand the Ansar very well. Right? They were people who chose this. They chose this. Right, they chose to take the Muslims and to host them. Right, they opened up their doors. So they understood by opening up their doors, what have they done? They have shed their land. Right, basically, they understood that. Right? They understood what that mean, meant. And now they understood that their leader will be the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, which rubbed some people the wrong way. Right, which is why you have hypocrites appearing. Right, because we mentioned that Medina, before the bay'ah of Aqaba, they, there was a huge war. Right, in which the elders of Medina were killed off. Right, so that was also crucial because the elders were usually the ones in Mecca, right, they were the ones who stopped the da'wah. But they're so stuck on their ways. Right, so they were killed off. The people of Medina actually had come to a consensus that Abdullah bin Ubay would be their leader. And they have never come to a consensus about anyone. The Aws and the Khazraj were always at loggerheads for, for generations. They were fighting for a long time. After that war, right, Abdullah bin Ubay was, loved, was from the Khazraj, right, but he was loved by the Aws and the Muhajirun. So they both actually agreed, this was before they took the Bayah of them. they both actually kind of agreed to have him as their leader, to unite them in Yathrib. Then Rasulullah came along. And when they found Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were like, oh, this is, this is better than what we were looking for. Remember the story when they came to, to Mecca and they were like, like they, were, they were looking to the Quraysh to help them out? Because they were, basically, they were a people who were so broken up. They were not united whatsoever. And the Jews had come to the ranks, and the Jews were making them fight each other and whatsoever. Kind of, a lot of issues. Lah. So they actually came to Mecca to look for help from the Quraysh. The Quraysh rejected them. They found Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And there was a young man, remember, a young man who said that this is better than what you look, for, you were looking for. Right? He is better, right? So when it, that began, this part of the entire thing. So when Rasulullah came to Medina, Abdullah bin Ubay, who is the head of the hypocrites, he's a well-known munafiq, well-known, well-known munafiq, right? Uh, of course, you know he is supposed to be the leader. Then now they've moved their allegiance to this man, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he still wants to maintain his popularity with the people. So he displays Islam on the outward. Right, but what but we met your question basically is the Iman. <laughs> right. The Iman is fair out. There's no other answer to it. Right. It's the Iman that allowed them to actually give without any cause to them giving to the Muhajirun, peace be Allah. Right. It's in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. If let's say any one of us right now. Right, if someone was to say, you know, that I, I, you know, I, I need some help to go and study like, Islam further, or, you know, like we need help to build a madrasa, or we need help to build, you know, uh, uh, or like even, I mean, p- people in Singapore, especially when it comes to asatiza, when it comes to mashayef, when it comes to habaib, right, they are, they don't hold back their money. Right, people in Singapore, they give the asatiza money, you know, without, and they, don't, they have, they have no, they have no regrets because they know. When you give money to these people, 
right? It will go into, it will be channeled into correct places, right? And correct uses. So they have no, they have no, like, they have no qualms giving money to the masjid, to the institutions, to madaris, madrasas, whatsoever. Because why? You know, these people are people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your wealth will be multiplied in the next world. That was what's going on with the people of Ansar. Right? When they saw them bring their wealth, it's not a, a, a loss for them. Right? But it's basically these are the Sahaba, the Muhajirun. They were the first, foremost people who entered into Islam. Of course, I give my wealth to them. Of course, so it's, it's more of you know that, 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 that situation. So in Medina right now, okay, now Rasulullah has entered Medina, right? And we enter into Medina. Okay, we're going to speak about his entrance into Medina. Then I'm going to speak about the the, the the environment of Medina, right? For us to understand this. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam entered into Medina, first and foremost, the first thing that was heard from him, right, was that he says, "Aya ayuhan nas, afshus salam," right, spread peace, wa'atimu ta'am, right, and 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 feed the people food. Wasilu uh, arham, right, and and connect your status uh, rahim. Wasilu, I mean, connect, connect your rahim. I mean, status rahim. I mean, connect your ties of kinship. Wasalu uh, bilayli wa nasun niyam, right, and pray in the nights when the people are asleep. Tadkul jannata bissalam, right. You will enter paradise, you know, in peace. Right. So the first thing he said when he entered into Medina were these words. Like, oh, people, spread peace. And who could say that he is a man who is power hungry and he is, you know, out for war? Right? The first thing he entered into Medina, he said, spread peace. Right? And then he says, uh, and feed the, those who are hungry. Right? The society, society, feed those who need, right? give to those who need. And then, you know, connect your ties of kinship. Right? Give to those, you know, your, your, your own family. And then what? Pray in the night because you also need right to to, to connect to God Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? And Sayyidina Omar is narrated that Sayyidina Omar during his Khalifat, he was known not to sleep because he said that if we if Omar sleeps in the day, the people will be lost, and if Omar sleeps at night, Omar will be lost, <laughs> right? So Omar can't sleep because <laughs> he was. <laughs> He is a Khalifa at that time. So, so he just didn't sleep. He just did not sleep because he needed the night for himself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's said that whosoever does not speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the night, how can you speak to people in the day? How? Are you connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If not, you will be disconnected and then you will be astray on this path and leading people astray. So the hadith goes, وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَنَاسُ niyam. I pray in the night when people are asleep. And last one, Right, so first peace, right? Spread peace, always favor peace. That and the treaty of Hudaybiyah is a proof that our Prophet is a prophet of peace. Because he signed the treaty that said 10 years peace. He doesn't want war. He doesn't want war. He doesn't, he doesn't like war. He hates war. Right? Even Allah subhanahu in the Quran says when Allah commanded war, Allah says to Rasulullah, and you might not like something, but it is good for you. And you might like something, and it is not good. Is 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 something is not good for you. And this was was revealed on the account of the 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 command for jihad. He didn't like it. He didn't want to fight. Right, but you know there was good that will come out of it because you know you know this would be the last the last straw when it comes to to da'wah, right? To remove the barriers of those who stop the the, the truth from reaching. Right, other people. Right, this is the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, so salam. Right, uh, food. Right, feed the poor. Take care of those who are weak amongst you. Right, then your family. You can't neg- neglect your family. These are all the, the core things in Islam. Right, you know, peace. Right, be peaceful people. Don't fight. Right, uh, take care of those who are weak amongst you. It's it's core in Islam. Family. You can you can you can ignore your family, yourself and God. You must you must connect ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you are you are true to your belief. Right? Then only you are true to your belief. Right? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so he came into Medina, right? And, and and the people of Medina they began to rush out to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know the famous uh Nasheed Allah al Badru alayna, they began to sing, right, to welcome Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you can must imagine the kind of the atmosphere at that time when everybody is celebrating Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they began to come forward. And, and Abdullah bin Ubay, the, the head of the Munafiq, right, came to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "Oh Muhammad, right, my house is your house." Of course, you know he becomes, you know he, you know, show off. 
And he's showing off, you know, that, oh, I'm also a believer. I'm also someone who, you know, loves the Prophet. Right? But he's a, he's a known munafiq. He's a known hypocrite, Abdullah bin, bin Ubay. Abdullah bin Ubay. Abdullah bin Salam comes out. I'm going to tell you sorry now. Right? Abdullah bin Salam comes out. He is of the rabbis of the Jews, right? Of the learned men of the Jews, right? So people of the people of the book of the book. He's called the Hebra. Right? They basically, they, they, they are people who know the book. So he has been studying about this last prophet, right? And it's, been, it's a knowledge that is passed down from his, from his forefathers, passed down to him now. And he knows all the signs of the last prophet, right? So when he heard the prophet had come to Medina, he was in his home with his, with his uh, aunt, right? And he, 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 he let out a, you know, a, like, 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 like a shriek, you know, like, like, he, he, like an exclamation. Right? He exclaimed. Right? And the aunt looked at him and said that, you know, because it was an exclamation of, of, of joy, that the prophet is here, the prophet, well, he kind of, kind of knew that it was him. So he, 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 he let out an exclamation of joy, that the prophet is here. Right? And then the, 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 the aunt, his aunt said that, you know, had it been Musa bin Imran, you know, you would have shown more happiness, right? You know, had it been Sayyidina Musa, Nabi Musa, because they are the Jews, and they love Nabi Musa, alayhi salam. So he said, Musa bin Imran means Nabi Musa, alayhi salam. <laughs> and he said, had it been Musa bin Imran, you would have shown more happiness. And he said, of course, this is the brother of Musa, the last prophet. Right? So he understood, you know, and he saw the signs, he knew he was the last prophet. So he came out to meet Rasulullah Sallam, and when he first came into Medina, right? And he looked at the face of Rasulullah Sallam, and he knew he's a prophet. He knew without any doubt that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam right is the uh, the last prophet right. Let me just read his his, uh, his story here, eh? right. So so uh, so Rawa Bukhari fi uh, fi Islam Abdullah fi Islam Abdullah bin Salam. فقد كان حبرا. He was a rabbi. Right? He was a, a, not a rabbi, but you would say of a of the learned men of the Jews. Right. فطاحلا Ulama mina mina al fatahala ulama al yahud. He was of the the, the highest you know standing uh, scholars of the Jews. Walama samia bi bi maqdami Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam bi bi maqdami Rasulullah sallam bi Medina fi bani Najjar jaahu mustajilan. Right, he rushed to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he heard that he had come into Medina. Wa alqa ilayhi asila la yaglamuha illa Nabi. Right, and he gave him some questions that he knew from his book that nobody would know the answer except a prophet. Right, of course, Rasulullah answered them. وَلَمَّا سَمِعَ رُدُودَهُ right, When he heard the, 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 the response from Rasulullah Alaihi Wasallam, عَلَيْهَا آمَنَ بِهِ So, it, uh, so of course, the moment he heard the answer from Rasulullah Sallam, he, he believed in Rasulullah Sallam. Of course, from the faith of Rasulullah Sallam, he knew right, that this was definitely the last prophet. So, it was of the true Jews. Right, they were true to their book, true to their knowledge. Right, so he became, uh, he entered into Islam, right, and then he said to Rasulullah Sallam, Ya Rasulullah, Inna al-Yahuda qawmun buhdun. Right, for surely the, 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 the Jews, they are a people right, who lie. Right, they are slanderous and they lie. Right, so he knows his people. He knows what they are. And he says, in in ala in alimu bi islami qabla an tas'alahum bahatuni indak fa arsil rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam fa ja'at al yahud so he says to them if they knew of my islam right now before you ask them about me they would slander me it means they would you know they're known for that right they would say bad things about me ask them about me first before they know that i am a muslim Ask them this. What will they say? Okay. So Rasulullah called the Jews and they came. فَدَخَلَ وَدَخَلَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ سَلَامَ الْبَيْتِ فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَيُّ رَجُلٌ فِيكُمْ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ سَلَامَ So Rasulullah Abdul Bin Salam, some narrations say that he was hiding, right? And some narrations say he was there with them in the house. So Rasulullah said to the Jews, Who is Abdullah bin Salam amongst you? Right? What kind of man is he? And قَالُوا عالمنا وابن عالمنا وأخيرنا وابن أخيرنا right so he is the most knowledgeable of us and the descendants of those who were most knowledgeable of us and he is the best of us the descendants of those who are best of us 
right? So and Sayyiduna wa Ibn Sayyiduna, and some said, right? They they said, and he is our our leader, and the son and the descendants of our leaders, our Sayyid, you know, those who the one that we have exalted, and then. Uh, Sayyidina Muhammad Wa afdaluna wa ibnu afdaluna So they were praying They were praying Sayyidina Abdullah bin Salam The best of us And the son of the best of us Faqala Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Afara'aytum in aslama Abdullah So some said to them What do you think If Abdullah became Muslim If he entered into Islam And faqalu A'azahullahu min zalik and he said two times, right? Or three times. May Allah protect him from that. <laughs> they said that. No, Allah will protect him. He knows better. He knows better. So, فَخَرَجَ إِلَيْهِمْ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ right, So now Abdullah came out of his place. And right? he said, أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ right, So he proclaimed his Islam in front of them. And if he said, قَالُوا شَرُّنَا وَابْنُ شَرُّنَا Right, Sharrina, Ibn Sharrina. Right, the worst of us and the son of the worst of us. Right, and some of them said, you know, uh, uh, that he is the most uh, uh, jahil of us and, and, and the son of all those who are jahil of us, and the most ignorant of us, and the son of the ignoramus amongst us. Right, so they began to change their words exactly as how Abdullah bin Salam said they would do. Right, but catch them first, <laughs> right, and hear what they have to say before they knew he's actually a believer, then see, see how they are. So from then on, Rasul Sam is to not trust them. Right? Because that's how they are. That's how they are. And they change their words as, you know, in accordance to their nafs. Right? So, and then, uh, Wafi loves it. So, so uh, and then, and then uh, Abdullah bin Salam uh, said to them, Ya Ma'ashir al-Yahud, Oh, the, the tribe of the Yahud, Ittaqullah, have taqwa for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for Allah ki alladhi la ilaha illahu. For surely, right, I swear by Allah, the one that there is no God except him, إِنَّكُمْ لَتَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَأَنَّهُ جَاءَ بِالْحَقِّ Right, so Sayyidina Abdullah bin Salam said, For surely, I swear by Allah, the one that is no God except Him, for surely you know that He has come, that He that for surely you, you all know, there is no doubt you know He is the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you know He has come with truth. Right, so He called out His Yahud, the Jews. You all know, you know this. فَقَالُوا كَذَبْتُ and they said, you have lied. Right. Who's the liar here? <laughs> right, so here is the first meeting of Rasulullah with the Jews. And they will prove to be trouble till the end. Right, they will not be good news. Right, they will prove to be trouble from beginning to the end. And every tribe, of there were, there were three Jewish tribes, every one of them betrayed the Muslims. Every one of them. There will, there will be one very soon who will betray, then... One by one, they will all, each of them will betray the Muslims, whereas they have taken a pact with the Muslims, right, to actually, uh, uh, they, they are on the uh, alliance of the believers, right, but they betray, right, they will betray, right. So, it, um, actually, I want to go through the camel story very quickly, eh. So, basically, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he entered in the Mecca, in the Medina, the people were trying to say, come to my house, Rasulullah, come to my house, Rasulullah, you know, to, to, to invite him to their house. But Rasulullah said, uh, leave the camel. They try to grab the reins of the camel. And they leave the camel for surely she is commanded. Right? She's under the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So the reins were placed on her neck, right? backwards. That means over her head. That means not in front of her but behind her. Right? And she was allowed to walk. Right? So she walked, 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 walked. And every time she passed by her house, the people of the house would say, Here, here, you know, like come and sit with us. Right? So eventually she came to a land, right? And then she sat on the land. Right? And then she got up, and then she walked around again. She came to the same place and she sat. Right? So Rasulullah Sallam said that, okay, right, this is the land that Allah has chosen for us. This is the land whereby we will build our, the mosque and the house of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The closest house to that land was the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. Right? Uh, and he's of the, also mentioned to be the, 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 the relations of Rasulullah Sallallahu from Bani Najjar. Right? Bani Najjar are the maternal uncles. Remember that Sayyidina Hashim married a woman, yeah. Salma, from the beginning, yes, her family, <laughs> right? So, Bani Najjar is her family, her tribe, right? So, that's why Rasulullah has family in Medina from his great-grandfather, Sayyidina Hashim. Sayyidina Hashim said, Abdul Muttalib, Abdullah, Rasulullah SAW, right? So, just three generations up, right? So, that grandmother, Salma, right, who gave birth to Abdul Muttalib, right? Her family is Bani Najjar, right? So, he has relations through 
there. So they're like, they're like third cousins, right, or fourth cousins, right? They're basically that far, lah, right, in a way, but still family, right? Um, and this land belonged to the people of Bani Najjar. In fact, this land, when you go back in history, there was a king called Tuba. Right? Tuba, this king called Tuba, he is mentioned in Surah Dukhan. In Surah Dukhan, you will see the word Qawmu Tuba. Right? Qawmu Tuba, the people of Tuba were disbelievers. So in the surah, Allah spoke about them and how Allah destroyed them. Tuba himself was a believer. Right? He was a believer, his people were his believers, and eventually they killed him. Right? Because he was a believer. He actually went past Yathrib. And this was, was like hundreds of years before Rasulullah He was of the ancients. And of the ancients, he passed by Yathrib, right? and there were already Jews there who were waiting for the coming of the last prophet. Right, so when he was there, he heard of the Jews of Yathrib, and this was years, this was centuries before Rasulullah SAW. Right, when he was there, because we see from, from between Rasulullah and Sayyidina Isa is a good 700 years, you know, 500, 500 years. And from Sayyidina Isa to Rasulullah SAW, he was born in the year 571, or 570 in the Christian uh, era, the right, Christian calendar. Right, so, so there was this uh, 500 years of gap. Lah. So the Jews had figured Medina out by then, right, and they were already there. So Tuba was of the ancients, right, uh, between Sayyidina Isa and Rasulullah SAW. He came to Medina, he f- met with the Jews there, and he was told the last prophet would come and settle in Medina. So he actually bought land in Medina, and he basically, like, uh, wasiat, right, he placed uh, a will on the land, or, or like, a, like a advice on the land, or walk off the land, right, that this land is to be given to the prophet when he comes. So he bought the land and he sedeka the land to the prophet when he comes. This land was handed down from father to son, father to son, right, all the way down, right, to Sayyidina Ayyub, Abu Ayyub al Ansari. So he inherited a land, right, and it's also part of, and it's, it's also the land also belongs to, uh, so there's this part whereby, part of it belongs to Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al Ansari, and the part whereby the mosque is to be built belongs to orphan boys, also from Bani Najjar, also from a land that this Tuba actually. Bought, right, and, and dedicated to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So now the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has come to that land. Right, is the way Allah subhanahu wa taala has fulfilled the wish of Tuba, right, as as a righteous man, right, that the Prophet will live in your land, and Allah was the one who oversaw, right, that that indeed the Prophet will come and he will live in the land that you, uh, dedicated. So you know, you see, you can even do a good deed, right, for someone who who will live way 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 down the road. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of your sincerity for your good deed, right, Allah will preserve it for you and materialize it for you. Right, even though your descendants are gone, right, you are gone, nobody's around, no one even knew of this will. Right? Oh, they don't even know that this land was meant for the Prophet, no one knew. It was not passed down, the knowledge of that. But Allah knows. Right? Allah preserved the land, Allah reserved the land. Right? Rasulullah bought the land over from the orphan boys. Of course, it's his land because it was dedicated to him from Tuba. Right? But of course, he bought over the land right? and he uh, lived with Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al Ansari until his own uh, rooms and his own mosque was built. Right? Then he moved into his rooms and his mosque right, with his wives right? and his daughters had their own rooms also by the side of the mosque. Right, so it was not a house for him, but there were small rooms. And it was said that a small the room of Rasulullah SAW, if a young boy was to walk in, because Sayyidina Hassan Basri describes, when he was a young boy, he walked into the room of Rasulullah SAW, and he reached his hand up, and he could touch the ceiling as a young boy. That was how small the rooms were. It was enough for two people to sleep. Right, because Sayyidina Aisha said that uh, whenever he would uh, pray, right, she would have to bend her knees right, for him to be able to pray in the room, right, the small room that they actually used to live in. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, right, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the deep love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, enable us to see him in our dreams, in a weakened state, enable us to see him on the day of judgment, which is the most important part, to see him at the point of death, on the day of judgment, to say that we, 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 we study his life out of a deep love for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of wanting to know more about our beloved and wanting to be able to follow Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The strongest way by which you hold on to this religion is to learn from, is, is to love for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the strongest way to fall in love with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to learn his, 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 his life. Right? And that will fill you up. And what is good? 
and what is uh, believed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be of the Ansar because now we're going to enter into the Ansar story of the Ansar and, and, and every time every era there will be the Ansar right? there will be those who will help this religion right? who will be to the, to the service and the assistance of this religion may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those people right? who will be of the service and of the assistance of this religion and fill our hearts right, with, the, with the light of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbi wa sallam. Right? And subhanallah, and be of those people who rejoice when Rasulullah sallallahu came into Medina as how we should rejoice that he has come into our lives. Whereby right? there were those of them in, 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 in Medina right? who, would, they would, who they would sing to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we are right? the, the, the neighbors of the Bani Najjar. And they will they say, you know, we are the, the, the neighbors of Bani Najjar and we will love to have Muhammad as our neighbor. And then the Rasulullah turns to them and said that, do you all love me? Right? And they said that, you know, for sure we swear by Allah, Ya Rasulullah, we love you. Right? And then he says to them, for surely I swear by Allah that my heart loves all of you. And so he's coming into Medina where, he, where they, subhanAllah, you see the kind of love that is between them and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to experience such love from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send his great salawats and blessings Salutations and blessings unto, unto our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? The one who pointed us to, to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who guided us to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? The one you know by whom Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala created the creation, and the one by whom Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala will save this ummah right, on the day of judgment. You know, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala give you know His great blessings right, forever and ever unto our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammadin. وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة نرزق ما نفع ما خالص مقبول وحس التعاني مدللا على الهدى ويسر بالقول صلى الله عليه وسلم والأرواح معالمين ما يشيخنا وذا بالحقوق علينا وإلى حضر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika ashra la ilaha ila anta astaghfirka wa atubu ilaik Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallam Assalamu alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh